Hi, and welcome to another episode of Open Heart. I am Thomas Le Huang, and you're listening to the TL Podcast. So there's a difference between training and training. There are times when I know people go and attend training after training and after training, and they have not improved. I was uh, having a chat with uh, salespeople from a uh, different network, so someone who wanted to get some help from me. This person had been uh, into training for the last 10 months, and they have not improved. I could hear just from the few minutes of phone calls that this person here was lacking the skill, but also was lacking the mindset. And then therefore, whatever training they were getting, they were not given the right remedy. If I had the flu, I mean, maybe not the flu, but if I had a bad illness, it's not enough to sit in front of a doctor. The doctor has to give me the right medication. And so it's the same thing. If I went to a training session and I sit in front of a trainer, it is the responsibility of the trainer to make me feel better, to make me feel like I can conquer mountains, to make me feel inspired. And so today I just want to talk to you about training. Every second month, I train a lot of newcomers in real estate sales. I can never lose that love. It inspires me. Every single time I see people who walk into the room from day one a bit anxious, uh, sometimes (laughs) full of fears. And on day three, when I see them walk away from the session happy, totally inspired to do the best they can, that inspires me. That really urges me to go for more. So what I'm trying to say is that whenever I train people, the beautiful part of seeing that flower on day one becoming or opening up on day three, that is sufficient to keep me going for more. It urges me to look for more in human psyche and understand how to make those flowers get even better or open up faster every single time. I want to take today the time to share with you how I see training and how I I look at uh, new recruits before they come into sales. On day one, when they come in, I pay attention to who sits where, the way they move, who goes to what seats and introduce themselves to others, who does what. I mean, that gives you a lot of information in regards to who has got a lot of fees and who seems to be quite confident. It gives you a lot of information about their inner makeup when under stress. Because let's put it this way. When a new recruit walks into a room for training, he knows or she knows that there's going to be a lot of, not stress being put onto them, but self-stress, if you will. They put themselves under that kind of stress because they want to do well. They want to impress their leaders and they want to make sure that they learn everything they can so that when they go back to the office, they can really be ready to be an integral part of the team. The first thing I do is I ask them to introduce themselves. And as they introduce themselves, this gives me a lot of information in regards to their ability to communicate their ability to sell the bigger picture, their ability to make a point, and also their ability to control their stress. By the time the room has finished, I now know the different classifications in the group. I know who needs to be propped up. I know who has got an issue with values. I know who will feel highly confident, and now all it needs for me is just a few twitches. By putting them in different categories, I now will start adapting my delivery of content. Hence, I always say to people who come to my training, and they're always more than welcome to come back, every single delivery is different. Just like a Formula One, driving around Spa, Francorchamps in Belgium, it's never the same lap because wind condition changes, track condition changes. Therefore, every single lap is a that different. Even two laps in the same moment, within two minutes, things could change. And so the same thing is about training. I don't believe in one training fits all. To me, training has to fit the person. The person does not have to fit training. In day one, when we first start our first role plays, Now, the speed at which people get up and find themselves a partner in order to do the role play tells me another set of information. When they start the role plays, whoever goes first gives me another bit of information. 
who start to take over and who seems to take command is very important to watch. Because I don't want to have that effect of having people who are more extrovert to impose their ways onto introvert. Now, as a trainer, it is my role in day one to control the balance. And so what I'll do is I will make sure that I will find a way to prop up the introverts, the ones that need to come out. And I will keep a tap on the highly extrovert. As soon as a value is broken, this is now when I have to step in. Because as a trainer, that is your first conflict, if you will, in the room. You have to know the values that you want in your organization. And you have to be ready to stand up for them. Now, at times, even with the highest level of care and the utmost standard of gift wrapping, if you will, you know that you can't even get that highly introvert to prop up. This is when, as a trainer, you can't give up on a person. I think that you have to really go out there as a trainer and really look into your armada of weaponry to find techniques and ways to develop even the most introvert in the room. Because if you can really get the most out of an introvert in the room, it sends a beautiful message to everybody else. You may say to me, all right, so what do you do with a guy who's highly extrovert and who thinks very much with a superior mindset that he thinks that he's better than anybody else? Well, you don't want to kill that. As a salesperson, you want a salesperson who's got that. Therefore, killing it is stupid. But what you need to do is to deserve their trust. You can't just sit in a room and deliver information and think that people are going to give you their trust. So what I usually do is I will then pick up that top performer and I will do a role play with him. And what I'll do in the role play is to drive him to a high level of skill. And at some stage he will stumble. And then I'll ask him to do it onto me. And this is now the opportunity or this is a time now when I ask him to just give it all and answer his questions. If I can't really do that, then chances are I will lose the trust of the team. But in the 20 years that I've been doing this, I have yet to see one person achieve that. But because I can handle that person, well, now, if you have won over the biggest hooligan in the group, chances are everybody else is going to toe in the line. And I think that as a trainer, you have to have the courage to step up and not just ask for respect or demand it. You earn it. And you earn it by putting yourself at the lowest level and be ready to be tested by someone in the room. Now, around the end of day one, I can see already who is going to go well. The people who are not, well, I have a look. Where are they at? Are we at the level where I have to improve them in the lines, with their lines, knowing the lines, knowing what to say? Or are we at the level of the intonation not being right or body language? Then once I have that, then I know, okay, the uh, skill level is all right or not. Accordingly, I will focus on them on day two. Should they finish on day one with a high level of skill being exposed, I now will start to look at their mindset. And quite often the mindset is pretty good if they are the best in the room. You can see their mindset. But that doesn't mean that you can't push. And that's when I push them to the next level. I want to have a look at how far they can go with their mindset. And the level that they will excel with their mindset will give me clues about their self, whether the self is strong. And all of these things has to be done in such a way that it gives you information about them. Why? Not for you to manipulate them. This is not the purpose. But it's for you to help them reach the next level. You see, when I look at a recruit coming in and spending three days to study and better themselves, I don't think that they owe me a thing. I think that I owe to them to make sure that those three days are not wasted. And so I know that in three days, which is a very short period of time, I have to be able to turn these people who've never done a listing presentation into a listing agent, into a listing machine. And it can be done, it has been done many times, and in the 20 years that I've been doing this, it has achieved a great amount of listings and great amount of sales in people's life. 
We have to really think of the recruit as our master and not the other way around. When I'm in that training room, I want to stay alert to every single thing. I don't need to be close to them because some trainers, they like to stay close to people and listen to what they say. And what they do is that they skew their training into listening for the words. And as we know as trainers, that words are nothing else but about 7% of communication. Therefore, even the best lines are only going to give about 7% guarantee of success to someone. What you need to do is to focus on the other 93%. And I believe that standing far gets you to forget the words that they're saying, even though sometimes you can still hear one word or here and there, especially repetitive words or redundant words or negative words that they use. But then it forces you to really study the 93%. Now, by day two, yes, the way that they enter the room, again, tells me whether they have improved from the day before. The seatings is very common. In all of my years of training, I've noticed that the seating seems to always be the same. And it is up to me to now force them to swap places or the seating to change. But that also does something for me. It gets them out of their comfort zone. A new seat is usually, on a new day, is usually an out-of-comfort experience. And then I will start with a role play. And quite often as I start on a role play, now it depends, it depends. There are times when I don't even start with a role play because the level of the group is not strong enough. So you, what you don't want to do is to deflate their mindset. But quite often on day two, we start with a role play and then I'll start with one person. Sometimes it happens already on day one, but I, I rather keep that for day two. Because two things happen. The persons or the people that I bring up, they have either studied or not studied the script that we have told them the day before. Remember, I said words are not important. However, you still have to know your words. But you have to understand that once you know your words, they no longer the words. A good singer, when they are in a concert, are not really the singer who focus on their words. They focus on the audience. They make sure the audience is with them in the concert. So, yes, they have to know the lyrics. They go beyond the lyrics, if you will. And so the people who haven't studied tells me something about their desire to excel, maybe their ability to really take information. But more or less, it usually tells me whether they badly want it or not. And this is an opportunity, right? So we want to have a look. Now, no one's going to come in and sit down with us and tell us they're bad at studying, they're bad at sales, they're bad at communication. Everyone's going to try to make sure that they come up with the best stories about them. That is understandable. And so as a trainer, we have to develop the skill to know what is real and what is really real. So as we sit and I take them through the role plays, I have the tendency of taking on the worst person in the room, or one of the people from the weaker group, if you will. And I will get that person to do a role play with me. At this point in time here now, I'm on show again. Yesterday I was on show in letting people know, if you want to fight me with lines, here's my lines. Today I'm going to really show them how I really can create magic and transform even the weakest one in the room. And what I do is I will not stop the role play until I get that person to win. The first role play, they will show me whatever level they're at. Usually the entire team knows that they're not performing well. And it's a funny thing, you know. We may not know how to train, but we all know and recognize who does a good job and who doesn't. And so I will keep on pushing the button with training until there is a huge improvement between their first role play and their last role play. At this point in time here, this is when I know the entire room now wants to learn. The entire room now knows the benefit of mastering the material. And that's very important. Now, during day two, obviously, some people are going to fly. Others are going to start really on the struggle. And as a trainer, you have to make sure that everyone has a opportunity to improve. And so I focus a lot on the second group, the group of people who don't believe in themselves, who are scared of going out there and who are probably confused. By the end of day two, I usually ask them about who has changed their mindset. And you can see a huge percentage of the room changing already. 
And that's probably a great opportunity for me to see who needs more work, who has now trouble with either mindset or their own self. On day three, it's now fun. It's now the ability to just dance. The people who are really doing well, I just push them to dance. We go outside the lines until I see the full range of salesmanship, of showmanship. The people who are struggling, well, now I'm going to pair them up with some people who are stronger to help them out. And I always force the people who are stronger to take on the role of guardianship. And I truly believe that, you know, you improve way better when you are forced to teach somebody else. Because when you're forced to teach somebody else, there's a level of expectation that you're better than them. So there's a level of expectation that you know more than them. And so you're now not only paying attention to their words, but you are also paying attention to how you improve them. But what you're not realizing that it, what you're looking at is a mirror of yourself. Because now in improving them, you're actually forcing yourself to raise your standards. This is the beauty of training. And when you start seeing these flowers that on day one were totally closed off because you didn't know them, not, not that they were not open up. Many of these people know their song and know how good they are already. But because you don't know, to you, they are closed. But by day three, they have opened up. They are relaxed. They really who they are. And this is the opportunity for me to check on my notes and see the uh, difference between day one and day three, whether it is confirming what I thought about them on day one or where I got wrong. Now, even when I get wrong, I get a lesson. So I learn about where I've gone wrong, where I could improve the way that I diagnose their personality and what part of the entrance on day one that really sent me off in my judgment. And so I think it's very important when we train people that we don't focus on ourselves. As a trainer, I don't walk into a room hoping that people are going to like me. I've said it many times. If I want to be liked, I probably get a dog. So when I train people, I'm not there to be liked. I'm not even there to be respected. I'm not there to be admired. I'm not there on show. As a trainer, I have a job. And my job is to bring the best out in people. My job is to make sure that people walk away with something. Something about themselves. So a great trainer must focus on three elements, the trilogy of SMS, if you will. First element of training has to be skill. Yes, people are coming into the room because they want skills. Just like the person who is going to a concert, they are expecting to hear the song that they know the singer should be singing. But then there is a mindset and to me, I think that if you can impart onto people an opportunity to believe that they can do this, to now understand that maybe there are aspects of their personality that they could really enhance and understand that being negative, positive, being courageous, brave, disciplined, having empathy, that is nothing else but the desire to work on our mindset, to control our emotions, then you have done something better. What it means is that when you go to a concert, yes, after you hear the lyrics, what you want now is to have your emotions being stirred. But I think that the best kind of concert are the concert where when you walk out, you are no longer the same person. That somehow the artist has managed to not only entertain you, give you great feel, but they have touched that part of yourself that now make you a better person, a different person, a person who is willing to explore maybe some deeper part of yourself. And I think that when I do train salespeople, that is the uh, most important thing for me, is that by day three, when they walk out of the room, I have imparted onto them the ability to explore a deeper part of themselves, to want to know more about themselves to want to explore the part that they may have been scared of. And so during the three days throughout the exploration of the material, the skill gets higher. The mindset obviously will become more positive because when you are facing an onslaught of just positive emotions, you can't help but start feeling positive. And then by the end, you walk away with a deep desire to really find the true self that you are. And for me, that is the true part of training. And so my last advice for trainers are very simple. If you call yourself a trainer, 
you must know about people. You must know what it is that makes them tick, what get them scared, how you remove fear and fill them up with courage, how you ask them to do certain things that shows them that if they are working with you, they never fail, how to improve them instantly. You have to have the ability to improve anyone in less than two minutes. And so throughout my years of training, I have trained salespeople who have gone out there and listed a certain number of listings straight away. I don't believe in salespeople having to take three months, six months or a year to get good. I truly believe that if a salesperson is any good, within three days of training, they need to know what is expected of them and they should go out there and win listings straight away. Now, it's not that easy because a lot of salespeople, they have to go back to an environment that is not as demanding as my environment. When you're around me, I demand quite a lot. I expect that you think of yourself as an eagle. I was having a discussion with a friend of mine and he said, it's very difficult that sometimes, you know, some people are like eagles and they want to fly like eagles and they have to understand that other people want to feel like pigeons and we need to accept that they are going to be pigeons. I don't believe in that. I truly believe that everyone who wants to go in a world of sales, a tough world where they want to better themselves, they are either eagles or eaglets, if you will, in French, young eagles. So if I am a big eagle, it is important for me to recognize that I have a job to bring the best out of young eaglets, not turn them into pigeons, not remove all their courage for them to now believe that they can't do better than pigeons, but to give and instill into them such a level of belief that they would want to become a bigger eagle than me. And I, I think that this is what trainers should really focus on. Well, here it is. Thank you for listening to this. And I hope that I have shared with you some of the most important elements of training. Until next time, all the best. And you've been listening to an open heart series of TL Podcast.